What an awesome testimony from two staple members of Concord for many, many years, Red and Sally Usher. Man, I love them, and if you know them, you love them too. They've been at Concord serving, being a great example of what it is to be committed to one another in a marriage relationship. In fact, Red and Sally, along with all of us here in Claremont, are super excited about the new church campus launch happening right now at Mount Yona. So we want to welcome all of you as we gather together today under God's word, following hard after what God really desires for marriage. We're going to look today, beginning this series entitled, Tune In to a Successful Marriage. Tune In to a Successful Marriage. I don't know if you heard it. But Red and Sally have been married for over 60 years. Man, you don't see that very often. Over 60 years. That is a rarity in the culture in which you and I live. But what's unique is that the culture today actually believes that marriages are stronger in America right now than they have been in a real long time. Now that may come as a shock to you. I know it did come as a shock to me when I was reading the article in the New York Times that said, despite the hand-wringing about the institution of marriage, marriage in this country are stronger today than they have been in a long time. Now what they were doing is actually looking at the divorce numbers in America. And they discovered that the divorce numbers in America have actually gone down. But what they don't tell you is that fewer people are actually getting married. So of course if you have fewer people getting married, your divorce numbers are going to go down. But that does not mean that marriages are stronger today than they have been in a long time. But what we find is many people are choosing not to get married. Interesting, a Census Bureau done September 2014 reported the nation's marriage rate is the lowest since 1920. Check this out. In 1920, Those who were 18 years old and older, 65% of them were married. 65% of 18 years old and older, they were married. Today, it's 50% of individuals are married. Now, what's amazing is that we know in our current culture, it's become commonplace for young people, uh, 20s, 30s, sometimes even in the 40s, to not get married, but that does not mean that they're not living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. In fact, they're foregoing marriage altogether, oftentimes in our society, and they are cohabitating. And what they do now is they actually focus on their own personal success. So they go out and they get their jobs, they do well. Sometimes they have children, sometimes they don't. And then they actually use a marriage ceremony sometimes to bring all their family, all their friends together so that they can display or showcase how successful their lives have become. In fact, I read this as well in an article that says, marriage has become a status symbol in our culture, a highly regarded marker of a successful personal life. So they literally argue that Those who are living together oftentimes will use a marriage ceremony as a capstone for their success. You know, that is what's happening in the culture in which you and I live. It's not simply about a divorce rate. It is literally about the fact that people are undermining and undervaluing the institution of marriage. And when you think about this today, think about what culture says. We, as followers of Jesus need to make sure we know what Jesus says about marriage. So we're going to look at that together this morning. So let me go ahead and get you to open your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and we'll begin reading in verse 23 in just a moment. And as you're opening that up in your Bibles, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 23, let me kind of set the scene for you about what's happening here in this text of Scripture. You have the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they are putting Jesus on the spot about what he believes. Now, just a little background information. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they are of Jewish descent, but they actually have different uh, viewpoints on doctrine, uh, such as miracles, the afterlife, and the resurrection. Now, the Pharisees, they believe in miracles. They believe in the afterlife. They believe in the resurrection. But the Sadducees, they don't believe in miracles. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in life after death. And so in our text this morning, the Sadducees are going to put Jesus on the spot and they are actually going to ask him a question about marriage. But check this out. 
the question is designed to try to get Jesus to fall on one side of the playing field. In other words, to get him to side with either the Pharisees or to get him to side with the Sadducees. They're trying to figure out exactly where Jesus stands pointedly on the resurrection. Is there one or is there not one? And they couch their question with a marriage question. Now, I also have to tell you this because this is pretty interesting. Uh, The Deuteronomic law actually teaches in the Old Testament, and a lot of people don't know this, but this is a wild law. And let me give it to you like this. If I were married to my wife, which I am, but if I'm married to Krista, and I have an older brother or another brother who's alive today, and Krista and I are married, and let's say we're living uh, with one another, but we're unable to have children, and then one day I'm out in the field, and I'm uh, working really hard, and all of a sudden I just have a heart attack and fall over and die, and my wife is left there childless. What happens to her? Is she able to marry? Well, She is, but she's not able to marry outside the family. What would happen is that if I died, check this out, my wife would have to marry my brother. Now, when my brother and my wife, of course I'm deceased, so I guess I don't really care at this point, but once they're married, if they have a child, the first child is to be named after me, the deceased brother, so that my name is not erased from Jewish heritage. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, because some of you ladies, you're thinking about uh, your husband's brother, and you're like, there's no way in the world that's going to happen. And you're thanking Jesus right now that you're free from that law. But this is the law that they bring to Jesus. And they ask him a very pointed question, and I want us to look at it together. Matthew chapter 22, verse 23 says, stand with me in honor of God's word this morning. The Bible says, verse 23, on that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, now here's the verse, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. And also the second, and the third, and then down to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died. Now notice the question here. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures, nor the power of God, For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, you have not read what God has spoken to you. Verse 32, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your divine word. And as we open it today, it gives us insight into marriage. And I pray in the name of Christ that you would strengthen marriages in our fellowship so that your name might be glorified. We give you this time and pray you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you go ahead and be seated. Well, I shared all of this with you because I wanted you to see what is happening. The Sadducees are saying to Jesus, when this woman dies, who's she going to be married to? And by the way, who can you know, blame the woman for dying? I mean, she's married to seven brothers. She's probably glad to be dead, right? But Jesus makes a statement about marriage couched right in this. He says, you're not understanding the scriptures. You're not understanding the power of God. He says, in heaven... In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels. Now think about this for just a moment. What Jesus is actually saying is that this woman has nothing to worry about when she dies. She's not going to be confused when she is resurrected from the dead. She's not going to be running around heaven trying to figure out which one of the brothers she should be married to. Because in heaven, check it out now, marriage is unnecessary. Matter of fact, uh, there's a great quote that I give to you from Warren Wiersbe here. The Bible says, there will be no need for marriage in the next life because there will be no death. Therefore, it will not be necessary to bear children to replace those who die. 
Now, as I studied this personally, I'll tell you, I kind of got a little bit discouraged because, I mean, you know, my wife and I, uh, this year, we'll be married 15 years. I love Krista. And, uh, man, I think about heaven. And some of you, when you think about heaven and marriage being unnecessary, you're like, well, that's because it's a place of joy, right? That's why you're not going to be there married. When I think about that, I'm like, my word, I, what does this mean for Krista and I when we enter into the presence of God at the resurrection? Uh, what it means is that marriage is not only going to be unnecessary, but also it means that there's something unique about marriage here upon the earth. Now, I will tell you, just because some of you I know are concerned about this, this doesn't mean that when I enter into heaven, I'm not going to know Krista. In fact, I'm going to know her better then than I do now, and I'm going to love her more then than I am capable of loving her even right now, because I'm not going to be held back by this body of sin. So when I enter into heaven, I'm not concerned about marriage per se, because I know that I'm still going to have a relationship with Krista. But it does beg the question, if marriage is unnecessary in heaven, why is it such a big deal here upon the earth? If marriage is unnecessary in heaven, why does God put such emphasis on it right here upon the earth? Well, the obvious reason is for the continuation of the human race. Which, by the way, can only happen between a man and a woman. God instituted marriage that a man would be married to a woman and that they would be fruitful and multiply. That they would have children. Now, remember, in heaven, there is going to be no death. There's going to be no need for us to continue to have more children. Just like the angels. We'll not become angels, but we like the angels. And in that frame of mind, we know to hear that marriage is so important on the earth as God has designed it as a place for us to have children. And that's the obvious reason. But there's also a spiritual reason. And I want you to listen to this very closely. I found this quote from Gary Thomas. He writes it like this. A giant thread runs throughout Scripture comparing God's relationship to His people with the human institution of marriage. Notice that. All right, I want to say it again. A giant thread runs throughout Scripture comparing God's relationship to His people with the human institution of marriage. And we see this clearly in the Old Testament. In fact, you see that in the book of Hosea. God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute to serve as an example of His continued love for the people of Israel. As well, many times in the Old Testament, we see the people of God actually serving false gods. And what does the Lord describe them As doing, he says they are committing spiritual adultery. So, here again, marriage on earth is this great picture of God's relationship with his people. And so, as we move into the New Testament, what we see is that the Lord has established marriage to be a gospel stamp on the world. The Lord has designed marriage to be a gospel stamp on the world. You know, at our house, we have stamps that our children play with. Uh, our girls especially. So they have these stamps and they'll put them on their hand. They'll come put it on our hand. And what they're doing is just placing it there. And it's a picture of something. God. Now check this out. This is awesome. God has actually chosen to use marriage as a stamp upon the earth. To remind people of his relationship with his people. That's the spiritual reason. Matter of fact, you think about it. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, an awesome verse, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, this describes the act of a man starting a new life with a woman. But also, doesn't it give us a great picture of what Jesus did to establish a relationship with the church? Think about it. Jesus left his father's house in heaven, and he came to this earth in order to pursue a relationship with people, to establish his church. In fact, uh, as I was studying this, I was just, I mean, pretty much amazed at how God actually followed the Jewish uh, culture of how marriage happens here upon the earth. Matter of fact, listen to it like this. The Bible teaches us that Jesus came to the earth for the church. 
And whenever we think about how those in uh, the heritage of the Jews or Mary were overwhelmed when we see that a covenant of marriage uh, being established in a Jewish culture, the first thing that happened is that they would actually provide a dowry payment for the bride. Now think about this. God sent Jesus to get his bride the church, and then he provided a dowry payment for the church. What was that dowry payment? That dowry payment was actually the lifeblood of Jesus. Listen to Acts 20 and 28. The Bible says that the church of God was purchased by the blood of Jesus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, For you have been bought with a price. In other words, the greatest gift ever given to prove a true level of commitment in relationship was the very lifeblood of Christ. And then once an agreement was made with a dowry payment in Jewish culture, the son would return to his father's house and prepare a bridal chamber. Now think about that. He goes back to his father's house and he begins to build. Remember what Jesus said in the book of John chapter 14? He says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. See, the church was bought with the blood of Jesus. Jesus then ascended into heaven after his resurrection. And he is now building onto his father's house a place for the church. And then in Jewish custom, the father, when he deemed the timing was right, would actually let his son know he could go and get his bride. One commentator notes it this way. Although the bride was expecting her groom to come for her, she did not know the time of his coming. And as a result, the groom's arrival was preceded by a shout with the forewarning of the bride to be prepared for his coming. Think about that. God the Father, when the timing is right, will tell the Lord Jesus Christ to come and get his bride here upon the earth, the church. And how will we know that he is coming? Listen to the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then according to Jewish custom, as soon as the husband would get his bride and begin to bring her back to the house, they would actually have a ceremonial cleansing for the bride. You know what will happen when Jesus comes back for the church? He will bring us, the Bible says, to the judgment seat of Christ. And it will be there that we will be ceremonially cleansed. As we find that as we stand before Jesus, the fires of his judgment will actually come upon those of us who are believers. And we will be judged based upon our service. And those things that are of value will remain. And those things that are of no value that we spend our lives doing will be absolutely dissipated in that moment. But that's a cleansing process. And in the Jewish custom and culture, as soon as that is completed, what happens then is that the husband and the bride would have all of their family, all of their friends gathered there, and there would be a huge marriage supper. You know what the Bible teaches? This is awesome. The Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation, chapter 19 and verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And then he said to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So marriage, check it out, while unnecessary in heaven, plays a vital role upon the earth as a gospel stamp, as a stamp of the good news that Jesus came to redeem his bride, to purchase her, to prepare a place for her, to come back and get her, and have her with him for all of eternity. That's the gospel. That's what marriage on earth represents you know when we know this we begin to understand the reason why the great enemy of the light attacks the very foundation of the gospel satan knows that marriage is god's gospel stamp upon the world and earthly picture of a heavenly truth therefore in efforts to erase the gospel of jesus which redeems souls rescues men from their sin The enemy attacks anything, check this out, the enemy attacks anything that holds the potential to remind others of God's relationship with his people. So where it seems that culture is devaluing marriage, it truly is a demonic scheme to undermine the gospel. 
You know, when my children put a stamp on me and I've got that stamp there, I, I always go uh, at the end of the day and I wash that stamp off. I put it under the water. I try to get that off of my skin. Marriage upon the earth is a gospel stamp. The enemy wants to attack the institution of marriage because he is trying to erase off the very foundation of the earth anything that would remind people about the gospel of Christ. Now with all that in mind, I would say many of our problems in marriage, and uh, please listen because some of you came to church and you showed up because you, you have some issues in your marriage. And you're thinking, I'm going to go to church today and, man, we're going to hear some stuff. I know it's going to help our marriage. And I hope that it does. But most of the problems in marriage really aren't a problem with marriage. Most of the problems in marriage are a problem with God. So it may be that you showed up this morning just to find out that you don't have a marriage problem. You've got a God problem. And if our perspective of marriage is not in sync with God's perspective of marriage, then it's totally going to destroy how we respond to every single thing that happens in our marriage. In fact, I put this in your listening guide, so I want you to take a look at it for just a moment. I've got a little grid there for you. You see at the top left-hand corner it says, How do you see marriage? And then right beside it, it says the culture's view and then the Christian view. Now, let me just walk through the culture side, and I want you to see this. How do you see marriage? If, if you are of the culture's mindset, your perspective on marriage is going to be that marriage is designed to make me happy. And isn't that what a lot of people say, right? I, whatever makes you happy. Isn't that what a lot of men say? I just want this marriage to make me happy. A lot of women say the same thing. I want this marriage to make me happy. It's a selfish perspective. And if that's your perspective, notice when you come to making decisions, you'll make those decisions based upon your personal feelings. In other words, if the wife is doing something that doesn't make me personally happy, then I'm going to begin to make decisions to change the situation and vice versa. And then problems in marriage. And I'll tell you, this is so true. How many people have sat down in my office and I have heard this. My spouse is not meeting my needs. Now check this out. When you have this culture's view of marriage, not a Christian view, not a godly view, you begin to see things in your spouse that begin to kind of rub you the wrong way to kind of mess you up on the inside. And so you become angry with your spouse. You begin to fight with your spouse and argue over all sorts of things. And that's how some of you are even this morning. You came to church, and man, you've got your face on right now. But before you showed up inside of this building, you were arguing your, with your wife. There are these walls between you and your spouse. And man, there is this impenetrable wall that's holding you back. And you think your problem is your wife. You think your problem is your husband. That's why whenever we look at the culture's view, it goes down then to the aim. I want my marriage to fulfill my desires. Well, and how, many, how many guys are saying that? Well, she just doesn't fulfill my desires anymore. Hey, listen, bro. Marriage ain't about your desires being fulfilled. What is marriage about? Marriage is about God. And when we get this Christian perspective, notice the difference. You're not going around saying marriage is designed to make me happy. Now you realize marriage is a gospel stamp on the world. So my marriage should reflect the gospel. As the husband, I represent Jesus, Ephesians chapter 5. My wife, she represents the church, Ephesians chapter 5 as well. And as we are in a relationship with one another, we are supposed to be a gospel stamp to remind people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That change of perspective leads us to look at decision-making completely different. Instead of making decisions based upon our personal feelings, we make decisions based upon what best represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, some of you husbands are looking at stuff on the Internet. Does that best represent Jesus? 
Some of you wives are texting people that you should not be texting. You're trying to spend time with people in the office you shouldn't be spending time with. Does that represent Jesus well? Does that represent the gospel well? And then when we change our perspective, listen, problems in marriage no longer are my wife, no longer, as a wife would say, are my husband. He's not the problem. When you have a Christian perspective, you realize that problems in marriage are a spiritual attack. And you respond with prayer and you respond with the word. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Your problem is not your wife. Your problem is not your husband. Your problem may very well be that you have a wrong perspective on marriage, an unbiblical perspective. And then your aim is totally different. I love this, all right? I love it. If you have the culture's view, you want marriage to fulfill your desires. But if you have a Christian view, you want your marriage to make the gospel more believable. Think about that, right? Your marriage should make the gospel of Jesus Christ more believable to those who are outside the faith. Could you say that about your marriage? If people hung out with you all week long, your husband, and they hung out with you and your wife all week long, would they come away believing the gospel even more so? Or would they come away saying, hey, they don't see any difference whatsoever. Now, really what I wanted to do this morning is kind of just ask you what your perspective on marriage is. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm realizing. You cannot see your marriage be all that God has intended for it to be, for his glory, for his gospel, until your perspective is changed. And a lot of times I hear messages on marriage and there's some practical steps. You ought to date your wife. You ought to spend more time with it. And I'm down with that. If you want to do that, knock yourself out. But if you have an unbiblical perspective, I don't care how many times you date, there's still going to be a problem. There's still going to be a rub. You're not going to be all that God desires for you to be. You know, I read it in the book Sacred Marriage. And I want you to listen to this because this is awesome. It says, years ago... Paul Simon wrote a best-selling song proclaiming 50 ways to leave your lover. A Christian needs just one reason to stay with his or her lover. The analogy of Christ and his church. Look at me, eyeball to eyeball. Jesus said to the church, I will never leave you or forsake you. When you think about your marriage, what perspective do you have? Have you been more influenced by the culture or are you being more influenced by what the scriptures actually teach? That's why we want to tune in this morning to the reality that we must stay together because as a married couple, we are a gospel stamp on the world. So really, all I want you to do this week, I'm not going to give you any kind of practical step, do this, do that. What I want you to do really is just think. Take that little grid that's in your listening outline. Take that little chart and walk through it. And ask God to tell you which perspective you really have on your marriage. And then ask the Lord to begin to change your perspective so that it matches His perspective. And let's be honest, eyeball to eyeball, many of you may be here today in church, but you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. The whole gospel message about Jesus coming to the earth, going to a cross, to shed his blood there, to be buried, to be resurrected, to go back into heaven and prepare a place, to come back. When he comes, can I ask you, are you going to be ready? When he comes, have you already uh, promised your life to him? Have you already trusted your heart with him? Do you know him? The Bible teaches God created us to know him, but what separates us is sin. And that's why God sent Jesus. He died for you. He was buried and resurrected. And this morning, I want to encourage you right where you are to turn from your sin and place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do this, you enter into a relationship with the Lord. And when you come to know the God who created even marriage, then... You as a husband, you as a wife, can be all that God desired for you to be. So if you've not made that decision, I'm going to encourage you to make it. 
Matter of fact, in just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. Pastor James is going to be right here in the front. And I'm going to invite you, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, to leave the place where you've been seated this entire time, and you come forward. I mean, leave the place where you've been seated. You walk forward. You just take James by the hand in just a moment as we begin to sing. And you just tell him, today I gave my life to Christ. Man, he wants to pray for you, help you along in your walk with Jesus. Or God may be calling you to join this fellowship. If that's the case, you come forward as well. But you be obedient to Christ. James, as you come and as the music begins to play, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, the invitation as always is yours. And so, God, I ask that you would draw people to yourself. God, I pray specifically for marriages as well and ask that you would strengthen us as we change our perspective to better match what you designed marriage to be. God, we thank you for how you're working today. And we give the invitation to you and ask that you would move. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.